Dr. Dan, what's happening? Brother. Welcome. Good to see you, my man. Oh man, we're in Sedona at Chocolate Tree. This is the place to be. Oh my goodness, man. The <laughs> hub of the hub of the hub. Huh? It is the hub of the hub. Wow, man. It's just uh, really been cool to, uh, to, to get to know you. Uh, met you at Magic Flow Bus. Had a yeah. fine flow day. Yeah. Up in Magic. Yeah. Um, just yeah, the there's intro. so much. What's that? That was just the intro. That was the intro, <laughs> right? More, more to come, I'm sure. Oh, man. It was like the, uh, yeah, the on-ramp to some awesomeness. Um, lots to talk about. I was thinking, wow, go right into things like consciousness, technology, black rainbows, uh, everything, all that, everything, science, all of it. So, um, what? how did you get into this space um, being a medical doctor? Great question. Um, there were two big entry points for me. Two weeks before medical school, dove off a pier, landed on my crown, broke my neck, started medical school in the halo. And that completely or reoriented me from surgical medicine into neurology and psychiatry. I got really curious about the mind, spinal cord rehabilitation, uh, getting my own brain back online after a series of pretty crazy concussions. And then after about 10 years or so in psychiatry and neurology, had my own clinic, was working in integrative medicine at the time, I was uh, still feeling like there was something else and was introduced to ayahuasca. And after that, the proverbial, there's life before medicine and there's life after medicine. When, when that weekend workshop concluded, I knew that was my path. There was more that I came in contact with in regards to my own mind and my own potential than I had accessed in 15 years of personal development work. And it wasn't to say that all of that work wasn't also helpful, um, but the crystallization, the clarity, and also the curiosity about what altered states have for us in regards to catalyzing our peak potential, really being this nexus point where more of the subconscious material comes onto the surface. We get to understand more about ourselves. And it's not always rosy. It's not always really sweet unicorns and fluffy rainbows. Sometimes the rainbows are black and the, yes. and the unicorns do stab us <laughs> with that lovely horn. And, yeah. you know, they, they turn into dragons. <laughs> right. And we're like impaled. It can be all kinds of crazy Unicorns. Uh, skewers. <laughs> right. Shish kebabs. Shish kebabs. We become the, the shish kebab on the end of their horn. Yeah, it's... And, but it was so fascinating, that world of psychedelic medicine, that I knew that my life was forever changed. And so at that point, systematically let go of attachments, let go of my clinic, like sold all my stuff. Just got so singularly curious about learning that methodology. Moved down to the jungle, started apprenticing with the medicine carriers, and eventually moved back. But um, those are probably the two biggest points, breaking my neck and then an intro into the medicine. Incredible. So you actually like just streamlined everything, just got down to the bare minimum, walked away from everything we know to dive fully in and immerse yourself in this world. Yeah. To really study. So that was almost like another uh, medical school in some Absolutely. Way. Yeah, that was my training and apprenticeship. So I had done medical residencies and fellowships, and this was my residency in more of a consciousness-based medicine. Right, so you had like pharmaceutical medicine, now you're going into plant medicines, right? Wow. Yeah. And so how long did you do that for? You said 10 years or something? Or? Well, I studied only with ayahuasca for eight years. Wow. And then I got full on shaman like apprenticeship. I was living down in the jungle for a little over a year in in an apprenticeship path, which is you go into isolation and where I was living was really small center. There's only a few other huts. 
no gringos, no running water, no electricity. I had my backpack and a hammock and really bare bones. It was so pure and awesome. And it helped me realize how far I had been disconnected from just the earth, natural rhythms, natural medicines, understanding how we have systematically removed ourselves culturally from a real close relationship with the earth, with where we come from. And as we can access these higher realms of consciousness, we come back full circle to realize everything is connected. When I throw something away, it doesn't go away. It just goes out of my sight and I feel better because now I'm not dealing with it. It's just like how we try and throw all of our other emotional experiences away or traumas away or how we repress things and we feel better that they're not on the surface but they're not away they're just out of sight but it's not out of mind and in fact when we have the opportunity to come back into contact with that we realize there's more to heal there's more to re-access because those traumas are oftentimes the crises that precede our transformation and to come back into contact with whatever it is that has been put under the rug or swept into the closet. Sometimes it's my stuff, sometimes it's not my stuff. Sometimes it's my ancestral stuff. Right? Transgenerational trauma does get passed on right into the DNA. So most people are repressing, suppressing all these feelings of resistance. You may not know exactly what they are, but they're just like putting it out of sight dealing with what's ever going on in their life, but eventually it catches up to them. Absolutely. We don't pay for it now, we will pay for it later. And the body stores the, the psycho-emotional debris. The, the issues are in the tissues, as some of my teachers would say. So the cellular memory holds experience, the organs hold experience, the psyche holds experience. If we keep running through our lives, with that in the background, it continues to shape our decisions, continues to shape our view of ourselves and the world, and it leads to cellular degeneration. It leads to chronic inflammatory conditions, inflammations of the mind, inflammations of the body. And we are at a state now where the uh, average annual um, life expectancy has been decreasing over the last couple of years. That's for a variety of reasons, one of which is the new opiate crisis and the opiate addiction um, that's getting worse and worse and is transcending cultural boundaries and norms. Before, like in my medical training in the 90s and 2000s, most of the heroin use was in the homeless population and it was with IV drug users who are on the streets and quote-unquote junkies and that's different now it's now in suburbia and it's now in the geriatric arena right so we, we've crossed now population like age normative previous boundaries right we've crossed from the urban homeless population into suburbia and we're seeing um, just with the opiates specifically the use of heroin increasing because many people are getting stuck on pain medications, but the pain medications are expensive and they have side effects. Heroin's really cheap and there's no side effects as much as the pharmaceuticals because you're just using pure dough. It doesn't have all the, the fillers and the tags of other pharmaceuticals. So yes, there's a lot of downside to using heroin. Absolutely. Um, it's extraordinarily addictive and you just see the the horrendous ramifications but if you're just making a day-to-day -day money decision I can either continue paying medications or for a tenth of the cost I can switch over to an opiate use of heroin so we're seeing some places in the country where 50% of the high school seniors are using heroin what yeah there's a three county area 90 miles outside of Washington DC where 50% of the high school seniors aren't necessarily addicted to heroin, but have experimented and are using heroin. Okay. Crazy numbers. Jeez. 
how are they getting this stuff, man? It's it's <laughs> infiltrated into yeah. the suburban construct, mm -hmm. and the zeitgeist is more and more um, appreciating the level of disconnect and the level of this subconscious but cultural trauma that we've been ignoring and the level of quick fix and challenged psychic connection to an uncomfortable state. Right. Like yeah. right now we're so used to getting onto the next thing and finding the next thing and being on this thing and doing whatever thing it is so that I can avoid getting in touch with what's uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. We don't teach our kids nor our adults culturally how to be with our own experience. There's a parallel process where the self-development and personal health section in the bookstores grows every day yes. with new meditation techniques, new strategies around overcoming addiction and depression and overeating or whatever the thing is. So there's a lot of information, but yet there's more and more disconnection all the time. And the pace at which we consume information is higher and higher all the time. And as a result, there's a challenged experience with us just being with ourselves and with one another that is going to come to some kind of inflection point. The epidemics are increasing and escalating in regards to not so much the, the ones that we've known historically, like pestilence and illness or war and famine, the epidemics now are epidemics of abundance because we have so many resources, we have so much time, we've kind of taken care of, many of us have taken care of our base level needs. And that's not to say that there aren't more and more homeless people as well, and there's more and more people that are actually choosing homelessness because the system doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. It's just really amazing that all the institutions are in major flux. Yes. Financial institution, political institution, agricultural institution, medical institution. Everything is in flux. So in the midst of that, we're going to experience that because we're all part of the collective. Right. And so when we do that, we recognize more and more that the epidemics of depression, anxiety, addiction, post-traumatic stress disorder, all of these are escalating even in the face of increased pharmaceutical use for psychiatric conditions. So medications aren't the answer. So what are the answers? And thus is the nature of our question and our right. query. Like, how do we get to play the game? Mm -hmm. Do the work on ourselves first and foremost, because we can't help people to, to do something that we haven't done for ourselves first. And so we put ourselves in the laboratory. Yeah, try out what's gonna work. Right. And the medicines oftentimes are some of those very important catalyzing forces that work for us to get clear with who we are and what we're here to do. So what is the lure that's happening for people in regards to um, always seeking pleasure and then avoiding pain? And like, how is it that we can sort of find a har harmony between the two because they both teach us lessons? Absolutely. You can't have the light without the dark. Um, it would be usually our choice, or at least from an ego perspective, to have it all like, you know, rose-colored glasses and sit the Mai Tais by the pool. But we got to do our work, and this is where it gets a little bit philosophical. Like, what is the soul level work that we're here to do? What did we incarnate to do? If there was a purpose for our being here, otherwise we're just like pleasure monkeys trying to find our fix. Yeah, right. We're there here. is a mysterious world that we sort of were born into, considering the cosmos. Right. And your your question is a good one because it's. It, very much relates to some of the philosophical conversations that many of the old teachers and ancient masters and lineage holders, like the Buddha, was very clear. The ego, its, it's binary bifurcation point is a cho choice towards what we desire more of, crave more, want more, and what we want to avoid, what we want to have less and less of and try and um, get more distance from. Usually that's something that's un uncomfortable. So the, the suffering is the conflict between those two polar opposites. Oftentimes that, that dancing between how, what is this craving that I'm looking for and what is this avoidance that I'm, I'm continuously running in my mind. 
and these are the these are the deeper conversations that we don't yet engage our youth in and that we weren't engaged in Matt, the vast majority of us weren't engaged in when we were young to actually ask these questions and develop our understanding of a relationship to these questions because I think in a, in a you in some ways, we're always understanding more and more of our own personal truth related to these questions over the development of the course of our lives. Yeah, that's who we were talking about with your buddy Jeffrey. Yeah. And, you know, it's like now I'm in a in my fourth decade, and I didn't have that when I was younger. So it's like now things are starting to make sense mm -hmm. and have a little bit of uh, data and history to compare things. Mm -hmm. And But back in the early days, I didn't have anybody really to talk to you about these philosophical questions. If I did, it might be considered like kooky and weird. Um, but every so often, I would somebody would like come in with some book that I was like, holy oh, crap, other people are talking about this kind of stuff. <laughs> right. And then you study like ancient history and you look at like some of the artifacts and you're like, I think they're also curious of what's going on back then too. Totally. Yeah. Yeah, people have been asking these questions for as long as we were awake. Maybe not as long as we were banging rocks around the fire. Yeah. But wherever that inflection point between our more kind of primal ancestry and the more self-aware parts of us that started to realize, oh, I have connection consciously with everything around me, with this little process of life, with one another. Who am I? Why am I here? These are some of the baseline level questions we've been asking ourselves since we've been able to stand upright. And how do these questions make more relevance now in a digital age that has more and more information flooding us all the time and the pace seems to be quickening all the time. Right. What was, what, so there's these theories of when a human animal became conscious and that was due like plant technologies back in the days because before that we were just maybe like other animals right. going about surviving, doing right. what like hangry and horny animal things right and then there was this sort of meta level that happened that inflection point that possibly happened through plant medicines it's very likely that that was the case and we can look at it pathophysiologically um so like dennis mckenna wrote a book on uh, terence mckenna wrote a book on um food for the gods it was a great discourse on how it was likely that we we explored and experimented just foraging, hunting and gathering, and came across psychedelic medicines. Maybe that was psilocybin, maybe that was Amanita mascara, maybe that was a variety of other medicines. What was the original soma? The soma, like this, this catalyzing natural medicine that served as a self-aware accelerator. And then neurologically, many people have also described the process where we myelinated our forebrain that maybe was related to coastal tribes living in close proximity to fish sources of natural oils uh, and the omega-3s, EPA and DHA, helping to expand the evolution of our brain and this larger brain that we have based on the, the mass of the rest of our body. And we have a pretty large brain for our size and a pretty sophisticated brain. Probably not the most sophisticated brain. It seems like dolphins have more sophisticated brains than we do. But dolphins are kind of hangry and horny. I mean, they're not as much hangry, but they're horny all the time. But there's no, there aren't a whole lot of natural predators for dolphins. Okay. And so they're having sex, they're playing. There wasn't a really evolutionary stimulus for them to evolve into a more complex um, community-based um, ecosystem that up-leveled their necessity for languaging and problem-solving in a group. Whereas like we, as two-legged naked monkeys, are pretty vulnerable and have historically been pretty vulnerable. Um, vulnerable to the weather elements, vulnerable to mountain lions and saber-toothed tigers and other big animals. So we had to get really sophisticated in how we work together and understand 
complex um, maneuvers and communication aspects of like bigger, uh, more accessible ways to gain the predominant status uh, on the eco chain, on the ecosystem. And that stimulus um, to learn how to hunt and protect and be, you know, get food and shelter to become warm and to make that maybe bearing straight passage in the Grand Migration, um, that may have stimulated because of necessity, because of uh, food sources that allowed for brain evolution, and also because of consciousness technologies that were likely in the plant kingdom, probably in the mushroom kingdom. So this inflection point, so when we see something like 2001 Space Odyssey, and the monkeys are hanging around, banging on rocks, and then there's a big black obelisk that comes and pops down, and that opening scene of 2001, which is a rad scene, Kubrick was, Kubrick was totally tapped in, makes me think like maybe that big black obelisk was like a cell phone. It <laughs> just like plopped down and monkeys started poking around on it and you're like, oh, technology. Yeah. Was that alien intervention? You know, who knows? But these are some of the important conversations to have and we're in Sedona, so we I know <laughs> oftentimes talk about alien interventions here. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking now, okay, so there's the inflection point and then so there's this conflict within all of us and it's getting worse or amplified through technology which technology is just a tool, right? So it feels like people are missing that primal aspect. They're getting disconnected, as you said, when you went back into the jungle, or went into the jungle and spent some time there. You're like, holy shit, like, I am part of this element, you know, not just the urban, suburban world, you know? And so there's this two world, conflict that's happening because you are missing that primal aspect of yourself and maybe through religion and other dogmas are making people feel like uh, maybe guilty or shameful and then technology comes in and you're just getting pleasure 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 all the time and so that you're just losing that balance between those two worlds that makes us more integrated and complete and so we need like some sort of intervention I would say like sometimes it's a car accident or absolutely or you can just go into a, a war like conscious war through like a, a plant medicine or something oftentimes it requires some kind of outside intervention because we don't as a species nor as a collective willingly give up our privilege unless there's a reason unless we're stimulated to. So if I'm comfortable, comfortable with my basic necessities, comfortable in where I'm living, how I'm feeling connected or not, comfortable in my state of numbness or whatever it is, if I'm comfortable, I'm not stimulated to change. And so oftentimes it requires an outside intervention. And that very often looks like crisis. Mm -hmm. Nothing stimulates us for change like crisis. Crisis precedes transformation every time. And so the crisis is actually an opportunity. And it's all about our perspective and how we engage that crisis. If we, if we have faith that it is an opportunity, and this is where I just, I love the, the reflection that Viktor Frankl offers in Man's Search for Meaning. The last of the great human freedoms is the ability to choose one's attitude in any given circumstance. And we have that opportunity to reflect, to shift our perspective, to have faith that what is happening is in my best good, it's in the, the grand scheme of things, moving me towards something that will be more enriching, more fulfilling. Most people even recognize that for themselves if given enough time to reflect and enough unbiased kind of massaging of the conversation that the things that were the oftentimes the most uncomfortable led us to a transformational process and therefore were allies for us. Yeah. But we don't know that until we're looking in the rearview mirror and we see that in hindsight. Right. It's the suffering part of the ego when 
going through the crisis because we're wanting to avoid and avert from what feels uncomfortable, which is getting oftentimes stripped away from our privilege and the things that make us comfortable. Sometimes that's just the, the, the function of a physical body. Of course we're getting, I love my body. I mean, I, you know, this is how I drive myself and my mind in the world. Sometimes, for myself included, I get attached to my body. I get attached to it feeling good and working well and looking a particular way. And that's not necessarily bad. It's just a point of reflection that if I'm attached to something and that attachment is removed, then I'm probably going to experience some degree of suffering. Can I use that as a catalyst for a better, a betterment of my mind, a betterment of my own connection? Sometimes it's just going through crisis in order to get humbled again mm -hmm. and reverent again for life, right? So that I don't just like piss it away, and it goes so quickly, and I'm not really sucking the juice and the marrow out of every moment that I can. I've certainly gotten my ass kicked through long periods of physical pain, psychic pain, suicidal depression, existential angst. When I moved back from the jungle, I could not relate to community life and like the Western way we move and the speed and the consumption. So I lived in a tent in a suicidal depression for a year trying to figure out what just happened. Wow. But that process was totally necessary. It was one of the best things that I ever went through. We as a field of psychiatry, that's my background is in psychiatry, we don't globally appreciate that the dark night of the soul is oftentimes a transformational process that's going to lead us to greater self-awareness, greater personal mastery, greater appreciation for life. It doesn't require pharmaceutical intervention. It doesn't require a prescription. Unless somebody's actively suicidal, they're, they're actively threatening their own lives or somebody else, that's when medications work. Right. And they have their place. Yeah. Pharmaceuticals have their place. But they, right now, are like the consumed and assumed primary intervention point for our medical model. And that's part of the disease model. And we're looking for an optimized, health-oriented, personal awakening model, personal awareness model, personal mastery model of medicine as a developmental process. And so if we can orient towards a more soul-centered medicine, appreciating that the dark night is a developmental aspect, and like, let's, let's have that as a part of the conversation and come back to more of the deeper awareness of how the crisis can actually be a part of the fertilizer for helping us to become more of our better selves and more connected to it. The, the privilege that it is to be in this body, mm -hmm. the privilege that we have in this one life, because it does go by really fast. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting with the crisis uh, point of view, that once you understand that, you can like sort of full throttle in life, using that as an impetus. Um, consciously, like you can start stepping into more of these uncomfortable situations, which you know because you know what environments or situations bring that up, mm -hmm. and so now you can sort of optimize that instead of it like hijacking you like through fight or flight. Now you can, in that moment, convert it into power and express yourself in ways that. Right. You know, now you should just start mentoring these like war zones, like a warrior. You know, it's really interesting. Yeah. It's in that such an alchemical process when we're 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 taking something and we're turning it into something else. We're taking a crisis, it's something that the ego would really move away from, start to fear, start to get like really cortisol cortisol injected. Um, adrenaline rushed, super fear based. And when we can work with the process of shifting that in our own minds, and we're sublimating it, we're turning that from fear into faith. That's a deep process, and I don't think there's anything quite as empowering to a person's process of self mastery than being able to turn fear into faith. At the core level, in the mind, that's the primal opportunity we have 
as alchemists. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because in the past I had read all these spiritual books and was seeking like enlightenment. And in the process of that, it sort of seemed like a, a benign path almost died, you know, sort of pushing the limits of using these technologies, whether it's plant medicines or uh, chemically derived medicines or using electricity technology and being hooked up to it all day long kind of thing. And so it's so easy to get like addicted to uh, that path where in some ways I'm lucky I'm still here, you know, and um, I'm grateful because this life is so precious and I don't know where it came from before and I, I don't know where I'm going after this, but I do know we're here. And a lot of times, like, people go into these sort of practices thinking that's going to be the answer to their problems, going to mm -hmm. solve everything. Mm -hmm. And in seeking that, they get into, like, guruitis or cults and other sort of perverted things that come out of seeking uh, a deeper reason why we're here, spirituality. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the end, it's like our mind likes to, like, cut and dice these things, whether it's body, mind, spirit. It makes it easier to communicate, but like ultimately for me, it's just becoming like more human and, and having that balance between like the animal and then the mature consciousness, integrated as one. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that was just one thing that I think a lot of people don't realize that when they go into that whole spiritual world, it's so easy to just get lost in it. Absolutely. And um, you're like, become a bliss junkie instead of a heroin junkie. You get, <laughs> get addicted to your own endogenous supply of opiates that your own body makes. And uh, one of the best things I ever heard was like, that sounds great, whether it comes from any of these masters, right? It's like, but does it grow corn? Right. Yeah. Are, are, do we have our boots on the ground? to do the work that's needed in the world to feed the children, so to speak. I love that, and I, does it grow corn? Is it practical? Yes, we can make it practical. One of my teachers is fond of saying, it's important to have our head in, head in the heavens and our boots on the ground. Yes, let's be connected to a sense of oneness and a sense of interconnectivity and that bliss state, that e ecstasis, and let's grow corn be practical, and be mindful of the generations to come. Are we leaving it home, our one collective home that is the planet? Are we leaving it better for those that are coming after us? And if not, is it, isn't it like our home? Right? If we invite a bunch of people over and they trash our home and then bolt, and we look around and we're like, wow, what the heck just happened? Everything's broken, everything's muddy, everything, like it was disrespected. How are we gonna feel? We're gonna feel like we were used, that we weren't taking, that we weren't taken into consideration. Maybe I'm not gonna wanna invite people over. <laughs> you know, okay. Yeah, you had the one sour uh, grape that affected the, the rest of the wine. Right. And we knew yeah. that, that's, that, that's not a, it's not a kind way to be, it's not a mindful way to be. So, so we can have that same attitude towards our planet. And again, if I'm throwing something away, where is it going? How, how am I and my choices and my choices for clothes and my choices for drinking food and my choices for how I live? Which is, a, you're in your home too, right? Yeah. yeah, how am I treating my body? How am I treating this home, this temple? Am I cleansing it? Oh, I just went through the first cleanse I had done in a long time, last week, that was so good, out of our, our friend's place at Grace Grove, where you're gonna be tonight. Yes. And it was great. Um, just the opportunity to slow down, to eat less. We went on a liquid diet for a week and ended up in, ended up in a liver gallbladder flush. And, and I hadn't done that process in years. And it was just really a beautiful, care to give the physical structure and you know there are a lot of people have different views on the need for detoxification and 
yeah, yeah, yeah. for fasting or so many opinions on so just that alone versus like how much you be in the world. Right. But you know, however we do it, it's nice to appreciate that we get attached to food, we get attached to certain things. It's nice to slow down. It's nice to clean out, just like we would go through a spring cleaning. That's right. essentially what we did for our bodies and it's like okay, we can do that for our home. Yeah. We can do that for our communities. We can do that for the planet. How do we clean up the mess that we've made? And in many respects, I think there's good evidence that we have created a fairly sizable mess that we don't yet know how to handle. Um, these huge plastic islands in the middle of the ocean, these huge clear cuts that are eliminating a, so, a, a portion of the rainforest the size of Connecticut every day, plus or minus, depending on estimations. But that's a, that's a massive amount of trees. Yeah. 100 species going extinct every day. These are because of all of our collective choices. So how do we share this kind of conversation in a way that doesn't feel so doom and gloom, that does have some proactive, um, personally empowered steps to make gradual but consistent approximations towards positive change that does have a sustainable benefit mm -hmm. for ourselves, for our communities to come. And oftentimes these are the kind of concepts and conversations that get woken right. and triggered through the medicine experience because we have oftentimes when the medicine experience is facilitated in a good way, it's safe. Set and setting is right, we've prepared well, we've dropped into a powerful experience and we've integrated that well. Oftentimes, people have these, this is the work that I do, I would say 80%, 80, 85% of the clients, and clients, friends and family I'm speaking with in the, in the process of integrating a peak experience, start talking about how to give back to a system and an experience and in a community and a planetary movement that's larger than just themselves. Right, just providing solutions through service. Recognizing that we're all in this together. This is all our home. Holy shit, did I forget that? Yeah. Now what can I do to make my own life better and help to do that for everybody? Right. And, and, and come to an orientation that whatever I want for myself, I want for everybody. And that's a radically different view than the cultural norm right now. Yeah, it's pretty wild because we are on like one big cell. <laughs> Absolutely. Big blue marble floating cell. Floating around yeah. in space. Right? Just flying through the galaxy. And uh, and I guess where we are like currently is sort of where it's the collective human um, combination of, of actions decisions and choices that were made so it's like okay the evidence is there's no trees here there's all this plastic in the ocean there's um, you know all kinds of destruction going on and we are sharing that even though like I'm not necessarily uh, I'm taking action to go the other way and to help heal the planet as a whole of how many seven billion people like we are collectively contributing to that. So it's like, that's a good, like, uh, I guess, measurement to see, okay, so this is where we're at, and are we gonna go, like, get worse, or are we gonna, like, improve it? Mm. So, and that's the same, like, how I start to see myself every day, and at the end of the day, it's like, did I uh, improve myself, or the world, or did I, like, destroy it? myself in the world so I think it's cool that if we could instead of fight each other on like philosophies and and ideas it's to say uh, I like what Jordan Peterson did saying like clean your own room mm -hmm. you know stop telling people or proselytizing or preaching like clean your own body your own mind your own spirit clean your own room your own house and if everybody did that then I think it would end up the sum total of all the human's actions would lead to a place that's better for generations. Absolutely. Personal responsibility. 
taking care of our own mess. And then serving. Make getting more and more sometimes that takes an honest inventory. Yes. You're an AA saying, have I taken an honest inventory? Have I taken do I have a clear view in the mirror of what's in alignment and what's not in alignment? And sometimes that's again that's that kind of the crisis process. Yeah. There's a reason that Morpheus asks Neo if he's ready to take the red pill. The awakening process is sometimes not comfortable. Me getting in touch with how messy my freaking room is might not be the most pleasant experience. And and who's going to help me see that clearly if I'm not able to see it myself? Which is wild because understanding cognitive biases and sort of our own internal blind spots, um, why we almost need each other for feedback as well. <laughs> you yeah. get feedback that you don't like to hear. Right. You're like, oh, okay, maybe I need to look at that. <laughs> right. In some way, that is another crisis. Yeah. It's totally true. It's interesting, too, in the day and age that we live in that has the opportunity to share information so quickly. And the Me Too movement that's been rising and women speaking out on behalf of their own frustration of the experience that they have men, many have received um, at the hands or the, the specific choice of men to not respect their boundaries, their wishes, their agreements that have transgressed those agreements or boundaries, etc. And how the opportunity to share that kind of information is bringing the potential to have all the shadow be moved into the light. Like we're no longer willing to go with the the norm that might have allowed some horrendous acts to be there before. Or if there was something that was really horrendous, it didn't have the potential to be globally communicated or shown fairly instantaneously. And so that's a power. The, the ability to globalize and digitize information instantaneously is a power. And with any power, like, like Spider-Man's uncle said, with any, with any power comes great responsibility. So how are we using that? How are we using our voice? And with this last school shooting, there's this like movement and mass of teenagers stepping up and saying, this is not right. We have not been protected. We are finding our global voice and they're having some significant impact. Yeah, People are paying significant attention. Mm -hmm. So there's, it's, it's a straw that dynamic. breaks the camel's back in like all these arenas. It's a dynamic time on the planet. Mm. And so it's it's a ripe time to be having these conversations. And when I think of something like the medicine arena, when these are technologies, the medicine arena is one consciousness technology that I'm very passionate about and connected to. And there are many consciousness technologies that can be accessed to help us catalyze our awareness of who we are and what we're here to do. Oftentimes with the medicine arena, when we have a reconnected experience, uh, what William James would speak about, like a religious experience, a transformational experience, when we have a sense of that peak experience that's a vision into our reconnectedness with one another and everything, then there's more of the inclination and desire to speak about these kind of concepts and how we are respecting or not one another, how we're respecting or not ourselves, how we're respecting or not the planet, how we're respecting or not the generations to come. These kind of things get stimulated in conversation more and more and more and more, which is why I get so excited about the medicines when they become more legalized mm -hmm. to help us shift into the next phase of our global living as a 
as a family of humanity in harmony together. Right, right. And what's interesting too is could you talk about the dark sides of that? Because like even what I was saying, chasing and led to man almost led to my death, chasing flow states. And I could see why some of these extreme athletes chase it because they, that first a few minutes or a day or two, they're, they're not feeling their demons. Their demons are gone. And then all of a sudden, bam, on the backside of the hangover from a flow state or something, those demons come back with vengeance. It's raging. Yes. And so um, with plant medicines and like you said, a proper like set and setting and guide, there's all these people that abuse it and it's become a touristy thing, a sort of trendy thing. So you see that like possibly happening with like the legaliz legalization of marijuana. Like there's such a huge responsibility with this power, this powerful tool, technology. Absolutely. I've, I've experienced that firsthand, with, with the, which is the seduction of the ecstatic state. And went way deep into the medicine arena. Part of it's because I was wanting to learn about it, and I took an apprenticeship path because I wanted to learn the methodology and the cultural understanding and the nuances of plant-based medicines. And ayahuasca is a very nuanced medicine. And, and historically, the medicine men and women who facilitate wouldn't facilitate for others maybe 10, 20 years in, into their apprenticeship because it's so complex and, and it requires a lot of understanding. And, and it's become super trendy, super chic today. Ayahuasca is one of many medicines that have been that has been globalized very quickly, and as a result, has stripped its um, growth rate. And is we are moving in the opposite direction of sustainability. We're not. We, we're we're also doing that with the forests. We're also doing that with a lot of our our community gardens and um, many other natural resources. If we're just talking about plant medicines. Ayahuasca is one of those. Medicines that takes 20 to 10 to 20 years to really propagate and mature. So does San Pedro cactus, so does peyote, another cactus in, indigenous to North America. Um, so is the Sonoran Desert Toad. So is Iboga, an African shrub that's amazing for opiate addiction and many other addictions. And if we're not paying attention, to giving back, to planting as much as we harvest, then we're going to consume that to the exclusion of the coming generations and the opportunity to, to share that medicine with others. So, yes, these medicines oftentimes lead to ecstatic experiences, but if we're not integrating that experience and we're just coming through a consumptive meal and we're just consuming that more and more and more, then are we taking somebody else's potential towards a path for their own awakening? These are all important conversations to have. And one of the, the seductive experiences in the bliss state is to want to try and continue to ride that high. Right. And we're not meant to do that. We're not meant to be in bliss all the time because there will be time to plant the corn. The beauty comes in finding the opportunity to see that as a blissful experience too. And to come into contact with the fears and that we're not just chasing our high to avoid our fears. So the opportunity to be an awakened person, a self-realized person, is to look at all aspects of ourselves, including our shadows. And that takes an honest inventory. Sometimes it takes a clear reflection from other people to say, is this the right use of this medicine? Are you having a right relationship with it? Are you integrating no, happy. the experience like, that you oh, just had? Sure. Because if I come out of an experience and my cup is full with all of this gold because it was just this blissful experience, am I just trying to pour more and more bliss into that full cup and, it's not and then it's just it's overflowing? It's in your DNA. Am I taking my yoga off the mat? Me? Am I taking my meditation off the cushion and making it workable in my life? 
at that point, if I'm doing that, and I know that I've milked that experience as much as I can, and there's still more work to do, great, then we come back into the medicine. And then we come back and we surrender again, and we pray it up, and we make a clear intention, and we let that go, and we trust the process that whatever's happening is happening in the right way. And that's a larger faith conversation about life in general, but also about the medicine path itself. The sustainability piece is one thing that many people aren't considering. Right. And integration is another piece that many people have historically not considered, and there's more and more discussion around that, which is helpful. But even uh, the training aspect of selecting the proper mature individuals that can like hold the set setting space um, because it's becoming trendy it's almost like a, you know a weekend certification course you know that people are yoga waska yeah <laughs> I just got my 200 hour training in the jungle I'm ready to teach my own class right facilitate my own circle hold space for other people's transformation that requires a lot of skill so that I'm not projecting my own stuff into that person's process of awakening. Mm -hmm. That I have the mindfulness also to know as like a spiritual EMT how to intervene when things get really hairy and when to not intervene and not try and rescue that person because they look uncomfortable. Right. And I've got my own rescue archetype that wants to be acknowledged for my ability to save somebody and then put on this altar with all of the other masters and idolized. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of personal development work that has to happen to come into that space of being clear, clean, strong, and skillful to be able to facilitate that process for another. Wow. So there's a sense of uh, bias that happens, right? Because you are looking at all the uh, people in general are looking at like just the, the best parts of things and then tossing the rest out mm -hmm. so you know whether it comes with these teachers or something a lot of people when these teachers leave they can't ask the teacher like what do you mean by this so like all the teachings get misconstrued and then of course with yoga waska or whatever it is this sense that now you're you're the leader a teacher that people are like now putting you up on a pedestal with this whole guru thing and then then comes all the seduction parts of you know I mean sex and love making is beautiful but at the same time like people are coming up to you and you don't have the training to say okay is this a more of a, a legit interaction or I'm just like here to just get off mm -hmm. all my power get as much money sex Famous feeding the ego. Yeah, feeding the ego. And all the ego's desire for recognition, validation, power. Which are all understandable. We all want to be recognized. We all want to be validated. We all want to have a sense of our own power being expressed and being recognized for its beauty. Right? That's the light side of power. And then there's the dark side of power. Just like the George Lucas yeah. nailed it with Star Wars, <laughs> Star Wars dude. Yeah. The dark side and the light side of the force. Mm -hmm. It's very archetypal, yeah. very primal. And it takes a lot of mindfulness and a lot of self-reflection. The teachers that I've enjoyed working with the most over long periods of time are those that continue to deflect praise. And they, they offer the praise back to their own teachers, to the medicine, and to the guru that is within everybody. And, and, and they, as a facilitator, are just the messenger. They're just in the support role. They're holding a really important role, but it's just one of support. And, and that degree of humility, to continue to recognize that the medicine is actually in the, in the medicine. The medicine is in the process. The medicine is in like our own willingness to show up and have the courage to go through what for some people can be a really scary experience. Mm -hmm. When the, the goddess herself turns into Kali and cuts our head off, you know, it can be kind of intense. <laughs> yes. And how do we show up again to do that work? Right. After we got our sh just our asses kicked and the shit scared out of us, how do we show up again 
to do that kind of work because we know it's a part of the process of becoming our better selves. I love this process because uh, you can actually experience sort of the scary movie without having to put yourself at risk of actually like losing your body, your body parts. So like some people will do extreme like skydiving or something or uh, free base, free climb, rock climbing and um, or maybe do MMA or something or go into war but you can actually like go to these scary places in your mind with the medicine and be safe, come out on the other end and have this greater appreciation for like life because there was some sort of ego death, at least in my experience. And at the same time, you come back into life and if you get that message, uh, life itself becomes almost psychedelic in a way where every experience is, again, going to those uncomfortable, pl uncomfortable places. Let's, let's say you're chasing your dream and you don't know like what the next step is in that, that hero's journey and you just go and face that dragon and in killing it metaphorically right you you come up with this information that you can now share with other people and uh, enable them to like be empowered to do whatever they're here to do yeah yeah it's i'm reminded of another terence mckenna He's just like such an icon, right? Because he was so prolific in his writing, so it's yeah. tapped in. It's unbelievable. He had this great definition of a shaman. The shaman is the one in the tribe or in the community that was willing to go to the edge of the known, jump off <laughs> into the unknown, have an experience, come back and tell people what happened. Okay? And there are those of us that are adventure seekers mm -hmm. and consciousness explorers that are willing to have these experiences first and foremost for our own betterment for our own process of self-awareness and, and depth and and that's also not to overly romanticize the medicine path because the medicines aren't for everybody and I don't think everybody's ready for them um, most people are able to utilize the experience if they've been prepared well um, but people are on a varying degrees of readiness and when prepared well and with a safe experience and full integration support it's amazing the transformations that happen and some of us are going to get called into that path earlier than others and so we're a bit on the front line of that you know, it's becoming more and more appreciated you know 10 years ago there wasn't there were really much at all discussion in the cultural norm around psychedelic medicines nor ayahuasca and uh, more and more is coming out more and more documentaries more and more excellent articles rolling stone had a great article last year um, the new yorker had a great article the year before um, the times just had an article on microdosing there was a cbs sunday morning special about microdosing just last week Wow. We're talking about major news syndicates, and that was a fairly positive discussion. And so that's happening. And so there's a reason that's happening. The data is becoming more and more widely available, published, recognized, and better studies are being done. So NDMA is going into phase three trials right now. NDMA could be legal in the next two to three years for for trained professionals, therapists, PhDs, MDs, to use MDMA specifically for PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder, just like ketamine's used right now, legally, but needs a prescription. Schedule three uh, for treatment-resistant depression. Ketamine's been legal for, she's 25 years, plus or minus. And, but only up until the last few years, if you've re re really been hearing about it, now ketamine clinics are popping up everywhere. Flotation clinics and flotation spas are po popping up everywhere. Flotation is an amazing consciousness tool. And it's a, gr it's a great healing tool, too, yeah. for the body and the mind. Right? We've talked a lot yeah. about flotation. Well, I remember you were saying that, that that would be like stage zero 
out of like let's say there was like four or five stages of uh, entering like higher levels or um, more advanced technologies you know yeah and that would be like the first one that people yeah. could do because you're in there right sensory deprivation right with just yourself floating in, in water salt right. water and in, in, in darkness and flotation is amazing it's definitely part of that preparation model right and so people are like oh I want to have a breakthrough experience with medicine go float first because if you can't hold your stuff together in the tank you're really gonna have a hard time in the experience Absolutely, yeah. and the tanks are just amazing because all of a sudden now there's no sight no sound no gravity no proprioception kind of like oneness we're not tracking ourselves in space and so generally 80 plus percent of all of the sensory stimuli is offline and we come into a greater experience with the connection of like who am i yeah what am i here to do what what am i connected to what's connected to me this big grand void that maybe where i came from before this life maybe where i'm going to after this life what's my feeling about that is there excitement? Is there fear? Is there confusion? Is there curiosity? All of it comes bubbling up to the surface. I love the flip tanks. Yeah, it's a mirror to your own awareness constantly. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. That's incredible. Um, let's talk about intuition now and like how people can discern how to like go down the path of their life and know like the light and the dark. Um, in regards to, let's say, um, getting involved with plant medicines or, or some other psychedelics, how would they know? I know how this happened for me, but how, how would they know um, that it's the right place to do it? Because mm -hmm. there's so many like scammers out there. Absolutely. And there's so many variables to, act, to assess somebody's readiness. And it's probably the most common question after mountains of emails <laughs> well, this about like, it, yeah. I, want, I want to have an experience. Mm -hmm. Am I ready? Can you help me? Can you point me in the right direction? Um, what tools and pieces of information are available? Um, and it's a good question and it's an important question to have. I oftentimes just point people into areas of accessing information. just getting more and more of their awareness of what they might be getting into. There are certain documentaries. Neurons to Nirvana is a great documentary um, on the history of medicines and where they're at and why they were made illegal and where the research is going now. There's a couple of specific documentaries that I really like. Um, I'm a bit biased. We have a good documentary that we did on ayahuasca uh, through Aubrey Marcus's website. He produced it. Okay. And um, he and I are good friends. We spend a lot of time in the jungles together. And um, what's, what's that going to be called? Ayahuasca. Okay. So if you um, Google Aubrey Marcus Ayahuasca documentary, it'll point to his. Oh, awesome. Yeah. And the reason I like it is because we did a good job in that documentary of just showing people's story and their process of going through the, the work and what's possible. Um, there is another good documentary on psilocybin called Psilocybin, A New Understanding. It's about more of the clinical data um, through, I think it was John Hopkins or maybe NYU's uh, research in psilocybin supporting people going through cancer experiences and the potential of end of life transition. And um, there's a mountain of information and a variety of websites that are popping up now. Maps, MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, they run the largest psychedelic research conference every year in the Bay. They have a mountain of good research on their website. Um, books, I like Jim Fadiman's Psychedelic Explorer's Guide. Mm -hmm. Jim's just a great writer. He's been in the field for eons, 60 years. Wow. Um, he's a gem of a guy. Uh, and it's good practical information for people um, to assess some of their own readiness. And then there's more and more available medicines in the underground community. And 
the benefit is that people have more and more access. So there's more and more conversations. There's more and more of this grassroots movement. When people wake up, they're like, holy shit, why isn't this available for everybody? Who told me that something from nature should be illegal? Who said psilocybin should be illegal? I mean, if we're talking about sustainability, psilocybin has the most street cred <laughs> because every, you can grow mushrooms anywhere. Right. And they're powerful. Mm -hmm. and they've been used for thousands of years. They grow out of shit. I mean, it's so alchemical. Right? It's something that grows out of shit that can help you really wake yeah. up and see your best from beautiful shit self. To shit. Yeah. From shit to shift, right? And as we start to have more and more of that availability, there's also more people who are facilitating who don't have the credentials the training, the own psychic awareness, their own deflection from that guru, savior, seduction, like I'm the one doing this. It's like I'm just here to be supportive to the process of your best self unfolding. Um, and therefore it's, and I've, I get those kind of emails all the time too. Like I had this crazy experience that left me traumatized. What do I do now? Mm -hmm. Or I had a wonderful conversation with a woman a couple of weeks ago. And she had a horrible experience 25 years ago that she's still experiencing PTSD from. Replaying in her mind over and over again. Yeah, because she didn't have the opportunity to have these kind of conversations and just say, oh, she had an awakening experience that she wasn't ready for. Didn't know how to integrate. Shut it down. Made herself wrong for it. Family made her wrong for it and has been suffering through that trauma since. We had a conversation that helped her just normalize the process and and now all of a sudden her life, she's on a new trajectory. It's just that point of validation and knowing that the integration, is not everybody's wet, ready for that powerful experience, right? And how do we integrate the, the experiences that are less than optimal and less than ideal and less than that shift Maybe we're still in the shit. Maybe we're, we've only been birthed halfway and we're stuck in the canal. Right. How do we intervene? And this is where, this is part of the reason why we're cultivating more and more of these research protocols to help optimize the success for people going through these arts. And we're building the prototypes for the new centers of psychiatric medical care that use medicines as a foundational principle and pillar. It doesn't have to be medicine exclusive. Like, people don't have to only experience medicine in order to have psychiatric rehabilitative care. Right? But medicines are available to those that are ready, willing, and able to utilize that in a good way. And there's the whole other piece around dietary restoration, understanding genomes and like genetic potentials and targeted supplementation and neurochemical rehabilitation and microbiome microbiome yeah. exercise um, movement. all of it yeah. how to access flow states in a healthy way all of this comes into an umbrella of a sophisticated model that shows what psychiatric care can become and is moving towards because we see a renaissance happening in psychiatric medicine just like in all of medicine just like in most of the sectors that we talked about right political sector financial sector agricultural sector, education mm -hmm. all of the major institutions are shifting it's all a global crisis it's all a global opportunity and the more and more we get clear on what role the medicines do and don't play and how to offer people those in the right way, then we can start to prove not only the medicines, because the medicines are being proven, the data is great. We're proving the model, the model of the center and, the, and what the system looks like to have them integrated into. And then once we prove the model, then we franchise that out, franchise that so to speak, we scale that out, right. and then it becomes the movement, and it's the new normative of what psychiatric care can be. Yeah, it's beautiful, man. I mean, because these things start entering like mainstream uh, slowly over however long, maybe the last century, like all the different technologies. And it, we're, we were just children in the early days as 
our ancestors, you know, and, and so it's a chance for each succeeding generation to like mature what would be that global consciousness that I was talking about earlier, like seven billion people and there's more adults on the planet that are mature, that are teaching like the children that are in the, the earlier stages of development. So it's um, exciting that there's these kind of conversations happening in these varying sectors, whether it's political, um, even like the gun control issue. It's like, what is interesting is when the pendulum swings too far the other way because let's say it's school shootings, like let's ban guns, you know? And like, I agree, like, Guns should be in the hands of mature individuals that are like qualified and trained. I don't necessarily believe that this should be completely banned because there's a reason why we have like the Second Amendment, you know. And so a lot of these things get tossed out with the, the baby with the bathwater where if we could just have a discussion on how we can use these tools and technologies in a very mature way and teach people how to have these hard conversations, you know, like not just polarize on one side, mm. which is fine, but in the end, if these people that are at the extreme left or right can have a conversation with each other and find a solution that's more harmonious, you know, than, than just their way. Absolutely. I think there's so much more progress going to be occurring. And I feel like it is happening. I feel like we're at a place with social media and media and everything's so amplified and you yeah. see all these peculiar type of viewpoints um, and almost like even a, a new class of uh, genders or something. It's mm -hmm. really fascinating too. So I think that it's, it's really neat that if we can have a conversation with those hard talks mm. and not just be staring at our phones or diving just in the information that like gets us high because we believe in it but we actually read the other viewpoints or talk to other people other viewpoints and you're like why why does that poke me inside you know like maybe i'm a little dogmatic and i need to look at that blind spot absolutely yeah yeah have the opportunity to come together with curiosity, curiosity of other people's viewpoint, and what am I biased against, and how am I not appreciating the fact that they may have a point of truth too. Most people are doing the best that they can do at any given time, given the tools that they have. Myself included. My parents included when I was little. <laughs> you know, yeah. oh, they didn't do this for me, or they didn't do that for me. Right, like right. everybody's just doing the best that they can. And that doesn't mean like when people do crazy, stupid shit that's really mean to one another, that they shouldn't be held responsible. I don't have to agree with everybody's actions, but I, I try and be curious about what their perspective is. There might be something for me to learn. It's like basic tenets of nonviolent communication. Marshall Rosenberg's platform is great in that. It's really simple. Respect each other's point of view and get curious about it. You don't have to agree with it at the end of the day. And if they've done something that's egregious to one another, then make amends. Find an equitable way to come back into some degree of relation, as opposed to saying, you have no right to your perspective, which is like dogma, right? religious dogma oftentimes. Yeah, yeah man. Well, uh, it's been pretty deep, you know? Yeah, it's been yeah. a fun journey. Um, yes, what's, what's, what's next on your, like, path and your journey, like? Thanks for the question. It's always, uh, it's always fun to have the reflection of how many things are moving mm -hmm. <laughs> in my sphere. Sometimes I feel like the cat in the hat with so many awesome things in process. Um, well, for, well you, you did release a book on like how to heal the brain from yeah. concussion, so yeah. that's a, a, a big part of how we interface with this reality, because if the brain is damaged in some ways, where now it's an inflammation, chronic inflammation, or, or the hormones are not in balance or in harmony, that will affect how you 
interface with the Absolutely. world. And, and a lot of people will take that personally and, and not know that that their concussion led to their um, symptoms of acting a certain way, whether they have depression, anxiety, or they just are making these impulsive decisions. Absolutely. So once they realize, like, it's not necessarily me as a soul or a being, it's the mechanism is out of kilter. Absolutely. And, and if I could get that repaired, yeah. maybe I'll start to see the world a little more clear and I'll, I'll be more vitalized and charged. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's such sweet music that just came on. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, when we're... Including the lady I was talking earlier. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Uh, when we're thinking of, when I think about, if I'm working on my own system, or if I'm working with friend, family, or client, about a process they're going through, and and there are levels of complexity, there are levels of investigation, and then we have the opportunity to look back and see how many how many levels do we want to try and access the awareness of through that process. So if somebody's just going through like a simple decision or simple experience great sometimes a cigar is just a cigar it might be like I got a pain it's body based don't eat that food great hiking fell down broke my ankle maybe I just slipped and it wasn't like some you know hard healing that needed to happen or some like yeah, psychic intervention yeah it's like it's you're just, you're just like, broke your ankle you That's need it. better shoes yeah <laughs> So I think about it, body, mind, heart, and soul. All four of those levels and layers. Sometimes it's body-based, and I put brain and body. That's just hardware. So the book that you were speaking about that I launched last year, the Concussion Repair Manual, was largely two, two big areas that I geek out on a lot, have a fair bit of expertise, and I dive into pretty full on, is brain recovery and psychedelic medicines. And how those interface when we're looking at the brain and nervous system, we're looking at in the body itself, but particularly the brain and nervous system because of their relationship with consciousness, the psychedelic medicines, we're looking at hardware. And when we're looking at the other side of the equation, the psychedelic medicine piece, we're looking at consciousness, and we're looking at software. So we're doing the hardware and the software work together, and we're really accelerating people's optimal potential personal potential move and I see these two being like the anchor points, left hand, right hand, yin and yang. And so my entry, I told you about breaking my neck and I had five other really bad concussions. And when I was studying neurology, nobody had good, good answers for post-concussive syndrome and that was just horribly disappointing. So I put myself in the laboratory and I studied it for the last 20 years. I tried to find what would, what would work and what didn't work and I put it into the manual. Because it's frustrating to have an experience when your brain's not working the same. It's frustrating to have an experience when your body's not working well. But when your brain's not working well, everything feels super confusing. And, and really, like, like kind of linus with the dark cloud, you know, just like stumbling <laughs> around. Yeah. Trying to find the light switch in the dark. Yes. And so, that was a big entry point for me to come into an act of service, first of all, trying to figure out how to heal myself and then working with others through the same process. And the same thing with the consciousness piece, because we're doing the same investigation with brain and neuro excitatory, neuro harmonizing, neuro awakening methodologies, and consciousness excitatory, awakening, catalyzing, stimulating, growing experiences. The consciousness piece gets me more and more excited because um, it was just more like soul. What I think about in the soul of it, so body, my heart, soul. The soul aspect of why we're here, what we're here to do. What's our purpose and passion? How do we, how do we have the experience of ourselves as multidimensional beings, as whole, full, fulfilled, satisfied, awake humans? We can do that through an opportunity of healing the body, healing the brain, going through concussion recoveries. And if you have a concussion or a head trauma and you haven't dealt with that, it's really hard to get to the consciousness piece. But sometimes, interestingly enough, going through the consciousness piece will heal 
the body, the mind, the heart, the brain, the nervous system. Yeah, all of it. Right. So there's such a beautiful interface between the two. So I'm still doing a fair bit of neurocognitive recovery in the, con in the concussion healing arena. I'm, com I'm moving out to Boulder right now. I'm coming on board with two different agencies whose specialty is in neurologic recovery and repair. One is a chiropractic clinic, one is an osteopathic clinic, and, and, and me as an allopath, as an MD, have a, a lot that we can offer one another synergistically. I like working with other disciplines because they have a different frame that I get to learn from, and I have a different frame that they get to learn from. And I love that level of coll collaboration. I see that happening more and more in medicine too. I think it's necessary. Um, just like you were talking about before, like how do we learn from one another and kind of like grow our own awareness and just because I know from a particular standpoint doesn't make what you know wrong like how can I get more curious and so that's uh, that's what hangry and horny is <laughs> more and more yeah you get to learn from everybody you know <laughs> totally. yeah so the brain recovery piece is one aspect and then the psychedelic medical research and orientation more and more education and advocacy Full spectrum medicine is coming into its next evolution, and we're going to be producing courses and um, blueprinting the psychiatric renaissance through the psychedelic medical research and involvement being instituted into the the future centers that we know are the healing centers that offer the greatest potential for people to go through a healing experience to be able to be liberated from their suffering. So it's taking a bit of a traditional model in looking at suffering mind states into a contemporary medical arena and bringing the, the present technologies with some of the spiritual traditions or the consciousness-based traditions and how we stimulate people through a self-aware process that has consistently showed data to help people resolve depression, anxiety, PTSD, addiction. And when the centers are available and online, and we're prototyping the new centers now, then we're going to see a complete revolution in the entire healthcare industry. It's beautiful, man. Yeah. Two more things. Yeah. Um, are we in a virtual simulation? <laughs> Dude, I think every time I watch The Matrix, it makes me wonder how true that movie is. Um, and sometimes in my own experiences, not necessarily just in medicine experiences, in my own like lucid dream states or uh, being back here in Sedona, the, the, the grid, so to speak, is really clean and the veils are really thin and my dreams are really vivid. And I, and I can tell I'm asking questions in the dream time and I'm playing out different scenarios in the dream time just to come back with more information about that very question. Yeah. And I think in many ways we are. And in many ways, that's what we've opted into. Like perhaps being in the dream state or where we were before we were born or where we're gonna go back to after we're not here in this monkey suit. Maybe that's the re reality. Maybe that's the real experience of oneness. And maybe this is just the dream state of that reality that we're playing out for a reason. I do believe we're here for a reason. I don't necessarily believe that we're just here to kick it. I think we're here to learn and grow and evolve. It makes more sense that that would be the case to me. Um, I kind of see it as like this life school. We're always growing and always learning. And we're, we're, we've graduated when we're no longer in a suit. And we've crossed back over. So in some ways, I think it is a simulation, a virtual reality, if you want to call it that, simulation. Um, but I also believe it has merit and reason. Um, and we're here to grow form yeah. and to do this thing with each other, right. you know, have these physical experiences. Yes, and um, last question. It seemed like all the things that made you you at this moment, all the 
things and then dark things and then light things. Um, and it puts you in a position where you're helping people with consciousness, with being in the body, and this experience. Do you feel like you, you co-created that? Or mm. um, it's just happening to you? Great question. Because we were talking about that earlier, right? About So I'm, I just turned 40 last year, and because I have this uh, context of my life, it's starting to make sense. Like all my rock bottom moments led me to this place mm-hmm. that's putting me in a position to help people from uh, multiple areas of skill sets that I, I would not have been able to do that if I just said, okay, this is my path. That's all I'm gonna do. It was like the universe or cosmos or whatever was guiding me. It's like, no, I want you to go down here. Yeah. You're gonna pick up that tool. You're gonna come back here. You know, I want you to go over here. You're gonna yeah. pick up that tool. Now you got these tools right. that are gonna help people. And I can look back and go, well, maybe that was preordained or destiny. But at a certain level, I felt like I did it too. You know, absolutely. I fully believe what we're saying is true. I fully believe we co-create our existence, our reality, our lives. And fortunately, I'm becoming more conscious of that co-creation. Whereas before, I wasn't. I was still co-creating, but I wasn't doing it so consciously, like so will willingly, right? So directly and concertedly. Like, what am I right now orienting towards? If I'm oriented towards fear, towards scarcity, towards trauma or from trauma, I'm orienting towards those things. I'm still co-creating my reality. I'm still seeing the world and myself through the lens of fear, through the lens of scarcity. So I might want to hoard, I might want to continue to accumulate or consume. I might have a hole in my heart because of trauma that I just keep wanting to feed with food or chasing bliss or chasing flow or chasing sex or chasing work or chasing power and whatever that's not going to heal this hole because that's in my heart that's my emotional body and that trauma needs to be healed and then once that so i need to come back into contact with that trauma so if, if i'm running those programs i'm still co-creating my reality and some people and myself included at times in the past will see that co-creation not consciously as one of co-creation of like the, the world is happening to me and not with me life is happening to me and not with me if and that's a very disempowered frame to use that means i don't have the opportunity to shift it i have the opportunity to shift it at any point even when the shit's really going down and when the shit's really going down i have the greatest opportunity to shift it because then I've taken like all my fear and I've bundled it. It's been bundled. I've bundled it or it's been bundled. It's been co-creatively bundled into this experience. And then I can move from that darkness into the light. Or I can, like Joseph Campbell says, in the, in the cave you fear lies the treasure you seek. Mm-hmm. Right? So I can see that fear and I can move towards it. Or what in the midst of my worst experience can I find a yes to or gratefulness for? I still have my body, I still have this life, I still have life, I still have breath, I still have my relationships. And what can I find for gratitude for? How can I shift my mind? And the more and more and more I've been able to do that, the more it feels like life is just more and more abundant. And there's been certain certainly times in the past, there may certainly be times in the future, where something that I'm attached to gets removed, and then there's like this big void. And then I think all of a sudden now, I'm in the victim role again. And how do I deal with that again? But I'm getting better and better just watching sometimes that we all hold these same archetypes. The victim archetype, the saboteur, the prostitute, and the child. This is Carolyn Mace's work. Brilliant. We all run those archetypes. They all have light aspects and they all have shadow aspects. And if I can become more and more aware of what's coming online at any given time, because I don't graduate from those archetypes. They're still going to be there. I just get more aware of when they're there. I get more aware of like low blood sugar moments and I'm going to be hangry and I need to eat. Right. right? Or what's going to lead me to that so I get better in my exercise, better in my diet, better in my mind states. 
more easy in my relationships are the kind of conversations that I want to have more of. So I don't listen to Fox News. I don't drink Bush beer. It's not to make either of those wrong. They just don't resonate with me anymore. And they may not like Spiralina and, you know, <laughs> you know David Pramal and, you know, whatever it is. And I wouldn't have liked those 20 years ago. Yeah. yeah. So we're constantly evolving. We're constantly growing. We're constantly changing or accelerating you know, unfolding our relationship with truth. But there is this co-creation of my own relationship to truth, my personal truth, and universal truths. Universal truths don't change. There is the law of cause and effect. There is the law of polarity. Opposites are the same, they only differ in degree. This is from the Kabbalion, or Hermes Trace Mabustas, and it's a really cool philosophy on like hermetic tradition. It's like opposites are the same, they only differ in degree. I never got my head around that until the example of temperature. Like cold and hot are the same. They're, they're both temperatures, but they only differ in their sides of the pole, right? So there's polarity, there's masculine and feminine complements. There's all these universal laws that don't change. So there's a universal consciousness or a greater oversoul collective consciousness that Carl Jung would say and there's my own consciousness and my own subconscious so there's like subconscious conscious superconscious we're all co-creating the experience at any given moment when we can wake up to that it's really like awe-inspiring I'm in charge of nothing and everything I'm nothing and everything I am the center of my own universe because I'm the only one thinking these thoughts and looking out of these eyes and feeling this experience. And so it's so magnificently powerful and yet it's just a drop in the ocean. Or like Rumi says, this is an, an entire ocean in one drop. You're like, wow, okay, I can see it both ways. And maybe both are true. Man. Boom. Boom. The cheers to that. Cheers. Boom. <laughs> Mic drop. Mic drop. Awesome, man. Thank you so much, Dr. Dan, for yeah, coming brother. on, man. I look Super forward good. to more interaction. There will be more. Awesome. Undoubtedly. Man. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Yeah, and, uh, man, I'm going to listen to this, like, multiple times. So. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Yeah, don't <laughs> Wow. Good stuff, brother. Holy shit. <laughs>